it's uh, let's get moving here. Telemetry. We'll start at the very essence of telemetry. It comes from the Latin tele and meter, which means basically measurement from a distance. Uh, except uh, in France, where it would be measurement of a distance. They call it telemetry. All right. Why telemetry? First. Um, you need to monitor data while the test is ongoing. Sometimes that's necessary, sometimes it isn't. A lot of times in here I'm going to give you the things to consider about telemetry, but I'm not going to tell you what the best answer is. A lot of times the best answer is depending on what your CONOPS is. Uh, for example, if you have an operational aircraft which is running just fine and you want to put uh, telemetry on there, you might decide, you know what, I don't really need real-time telemetry. I can just put a recorder on there and just record it in the air. And when it comes back, then I can analyze it. Maybe I don't need to send that data to the ground. Maybe I can just record strain gauges on board the aircraft. It just depends on what your environment is. Uh, I had uh, some people in here one time who were building a new uh, boat uh, for the uh, SEALs and uh, they were considering whether they should put telemetry on it. And I said, well, what happens if it sinks? I mean, are you going to give them feedback in real time that tells them to stop doing something so it doesn't destroy the boat? Or do you want to destroy the boat because you want to know what happens? They're all wearing life jackets. Is it a problem? I never thought about it that way. So uh, the complexity of the data, uh, the new commercial airframes, they have tens of thousands of parameters on them to monitor. And uh, it's beyond what uh, one pilot can monitor. Typically, a pilot can only monitor about 100 to 150 parameters at a time. Beyond that, his ability to monitor those either goes down or his ability to fly the plane goes down. Um, of course, if it's something like a missile, and you're really not going to recover that and analyze the data, so telemetry could be very critical uh, in that in environment. Uh, now. I'm sure these videos won't work real well for Amy, but she will get the gist of it. If you ever go on a Japanese game show and uh, they ask you if you would like to strap water bottles onto your back and then pump them up and then launch you out into the lagoon, I'm here to tell you that the odds that there'll be telemetry in that involved in that test is probably pretty low. Now, I let this run all the way to the end here because the uh, last scene where they are uh, fishing him out of the water is uh, is just priceless because the, the, the look on his face as he comes up out of the water is, I cannot believe I volunteered to do that. Okay, we're just going to skip that. That's some notes. All right. Five, four, three, two, one, zero. We have ignition and liftoff from Cape Canaveral Air Station of the Air Force Delta II launch vehicle carrying the new GPS 2R satellite. Oh. We have had an anomaly. We need to secure the area. Once again, we had liftoff of Delta II launch vehicle from Cape Canaveral Air Station, and we just had a problem with the vehicle on the pad. If you watch in this area right here, uh, in this slowed down video, you will see uh, right there, that plume. They used telemetry to find that the uh, strap-on rocket fractured on the inside and sent uh, uh, flames into the side of the, uh, the uh, projectile so that the fuel cell inside uh, exploded. Uh, we were actually, uh, uh, my company representatives were there at the blockhouse when that, uh, when that occurred. And uh, we uh, had a rental car in the parking lot which uh, was burned to a crisp. So we're still doing paperwork on that. Okay, uh, they use telemetry in, uh, in, in race cars. Um, this uh, crash here uh, was one of the last ones with substandard uh, safety protocols in effect. When they went back and studied the telemetry in the video, 
if you watch uh, this car right here, this is the one that crashes, and you watch right down in here, right there, um, they think something happened, lost control, and he went straight into that wall there at almost 200 miles an hour and uh, was, uh, was killed instantly. Uh, that was one of the uh, premier crashes which caused them to change many of the safety protocols uh, in uh, Formula One racing. Um, that was, uh, they used telemetry, but even studying the films and studying the telemetry that they had, they were still never able to figure out why he lost control of the car and went into the wall at those kinds of speeds. Now, fleet ballistic missile. Um, this is the Trident submarine uh, launch. And uh, what happened on this and studying the telemetry is they found that it ignited too close to the water. Water went up and bent the nozzle and it had to be destroyed. It would not uh, follow its mission. Now, at some point, they're going to run out of uh, missiles and when that happens uh, we are looking for test pilots to uh, to fly these okay now high stress environments when you have a high stress environment like I talked about before too many things going on too fast you really cannot be watching the strain gauges and such on your airframe. You need telemetry so people on the ground can tell you what's going on. In this case, the pilot's comment was, I wanted to throw up, I just didn't know which way was up. And then uh, Airbus. Um, I like to tell the story about how when Airbus first started, the first uh, airframe they did, um, they were uh, uh, showing it at Le Bourget and they wind up, wound up flying it directly into the trees. And uh, the reason I show this is that this is a case of specifications. I will talk about specifications a lot in this class because anybody who's ever flown knows that, uh, who's been in the, in the uh, cockpit, knows that when you fly a plane, when you put it into autopilot, you press a button or throw a switch, and when you want to get regain control, you just simply touch the control surface uh, mechanisms and autopilot disengages. Well, they forgot to put that little fact in the specification for the firmware engineers. So when they came across the runway, they were trying to impress the audience. They put it in autopilot to fly so many meters above the, uh, the runway, and when they got to the end, they knew, just grab a hold of the control and pull back. Well, when they went out there to the crash site uh, and got the fire out, when they recovered the bodies, they found boot prints in the uh, front panels of the instrumentation where they believe the pilot had his feet up on that, pulling back on that stick as hard as he could because he knew what was going to happen. And he knew if he pulled hard enough, autopilot would disengage. But that wasn't in the spec. All he had to do was reach over and throw the autopilot switch to off. But it wasn't in the spec. He didn't know that. He relied on his training, and he died. So specifications maybe aren't as critical as that, but they're important. If you don't clearly spell out in your spec what you're looking for, when, and how, you might wind up getting results you don't care to have. Now, when things go right and everything is destroyed, certainly, if you've got a, uh, a missile environment like this, you need to be able to analyze the results of this test and go back and look to see what happened and why. For example, in this one, if you look at the video slowly and you freeze at a point in time and you look at this spot right here, you see that little dip in it. That is a uh, something that was supposed to happen because it's trying to follow the terrain and there was a small valley out there. So you need to uh, have telemetry and video and such to understand how it's working and was it doing its job properly. And when they first looked at the video they thought, oh we almost lost the missile, when instead what they found was that's where the valley was and it dipped like it was supposed to dip because it was supposed to stay so many feet above the surface. Uh, non-DOD applications. 
Um, the first one is this egg. They discovered that uh, one of the problems they have in, in uh, endangered birds is sometimes it makes sense to recover the eggs and raise them themselves, but they don't know what temperature to keep the eggs. They don't know how often to turn them and such, and so what they'll do is they'll take an endangered bird and when they lay eggs, they'll swap it for a telemetered egg and record the results and Im Im uh, implement that in a lab so that the eggs hatch. And then when they hatch, they put the hatchling back in the nest and uh, everything proceeds as normal. Some other uses of uh, that, that I recently saw, um, there was an article, this was fascinating, uh, about uh, two weeks ago. There's a, these birds uh, that are in the uh, uh, African subcontinent. They're called Swifts and they fly completely over the Sahara Desert. It takes 200 hours for them to fly from one end to the other, yet they do. And they do it nonstop. They didn't realize, they never stopped. They always wondered how did they get from one end to the other when they only they knew what their flight, flight speeds were, how did they do it? So they were able to instrument some of the birds and let them go and monitor it and come to find out they actually fall asleep in flight. They get high enough up, they flex their wings, they lock them in place and they fall asleep. They get their necessary sleep and then they start flapping their wings again. Uh, so telemetry was used to prove how they were spending 200 hours in the air. That's how. All right, so in, uh, in this course, okay, let's see if this works now. This is my first time playing with this, so uh, control P switches me to the pen. Let's see here. All right, so m what we're really going to work on, oh, there we go, is electrical telemetry. We'll talk about all aspects of it, and most of what we deal with is the electrical basis of telemetry where we're using uh, wires and, and, and RF, and I'll talk about uh, the different applications of that in this course. Um, but also uh, pneumatic telemetry. For example, in, uh, in trains, they actually use uh, pulses in the air pressure from the back of the train to the front of the train in order to send critical information about what's happening on the, uh, in the system. So I don't know how effective it is, but it seems to work because they've been doing it for a number of years uh, based on a very archaic uh, approach, but they do it. Now, we're going to, when we go through telemetry systems, we're going to talk, uh, we're going to start talking about transducers. Uh, we'll definitely talk about uh, transmitters and, and receivers, and, uh, and on, on this one, um, Brian, yeah, Brian can teach the class because he's with Quasonics and they know more about receivers and transmitters than I ever will, I'm sure. And then we'll spend a lot of time, of course, talking about telemetry ground stations, uh, how to process the data, receive the data, store the data, format the data. Um, one of the things that I'll spend time on probably in the third day are, is uh, recorder technology. I'm a member of the Range Commanders Council. I sit on the Chapter 10 committee, and so I've been uh, with them for a number of years helping develop the Chapter 10 standard and work through different test protocols on how to validate uh, uh, Chapter 10 recorders. So I certainly will talk a lot about that. It's near and dear to my heart. Now, in telemetry, I think we all know that rather than just one measure and being transmitted, we need to multiplex them together, and so we have to go through something called a multiplexer. And um, there are two ways of multiplexing data. The original way that they started doing years ago was in the frequency dom domain, and that's where I started in telemetry using FM multiplexes. Uh, and that's still used today in some areas, and I'll talk more uh, later about uh, some of those areas, but time domain multiplexing is more, uh, uh, more focused on where we are today in the telemetry market. People who specialize in frequency domain telemetry are niche players out there, but it has its place. Now, of course, when you're looking at this, the transmitter has to be very small in size and weight, and that's a relative thing. You know, if you have like a Swift that you want to instrument, it's got to be pretty small, but if you have a shuttle or a, a large uh, booster that you're instrumenting, 
you know, there's a trade-off involved in there. And I'll talk more about those trade-offs and some of the approaches to handle weight control in those environments. And uh, of course, the, the, the RF side, we have to be concerned about. And we're going to talk about uh, fade margins and ground bounce and all those effects and uh, later on in the second and third days of, of, of this course. So we'll talk all about those, uh, those subjects. Now, when we're going through this, you'll see that the modulated signal goes into a PWA or power amplifier uh, before being uh, sent to the uh, transmitter. And uh, typically, the processing system doesn't have a lot of uh, uh, size or power constraints. Um, usually, you build the shelter big enough to handle what you need. So there's not a lot to worry about there. You usually worry about it on the transmitting side more than the receiving side. We're going to break apart the antennas. We're going to break apart the, the, the LNAs. We're going to make sure we understand how all that plays into it. Then we'll get into the, the front end systems. Uh, and we'll talk a lot about storage and visualization uh, devices as well. <clears throat> antennas. At the antenna end, you have these, these blade antennas, which, um, let me get my soda here. These blade antennas, which are, are commonly uh, used on, on aircraft, you have uh, flat antennas for, uh, for missile environments. I'm sure Amy sees the flat antennas on those, uh, on those uh, boosters all the time, not blade antennas like this. On the receiving side, you could have uh, omnidirectional top hat antennas like this or uh, tracking antennas similar to this. It just depends on what your CONOPS is and how much power you're dealing with. Uh, there's no right or wrong answer. It's what your needs are. Now, system configurations of, of telemetry, uh, we will go through the, uh, the sensors, how to focus on the uh, sensors and the range that they, they do, your A to D, the, the filtering and signal conditioning of them. We'll talk about that. We're going to talk about the, uh, the, the multiplexing and the inserting of, of time and voice. We're going to, to deal with that. And then we'll deal with the, uh, the, the radio link, the receiving of that, that information, and then how to uh, record it and how to process it. And we'll talk about the, uh, the display environment as, as well. So all those topics we're going to talk about, and we'll spend a little bit of time talking about the uh, the uh, the extraterrestrial environment, space apps, where it does pretty much the same thing as uh, near Earth, except there's a return link. Um, do I have that here? Yeah, that's in the next slide uh, right there, where all of this on the top part is the same as the near Earth, but we have the uplink to the experiment that goes back. Now let me... Uh, Oops, sorry. Let me back up the slide and talk a little bit about the, the space applications. In space applications, um, typically the, the power is, is uh, very limited, so they're always very cautious about how they uh, uh, use their power in the space applications. And um, one of the things they, they tend to use is phase shift keying uh, in their modulation rather than FM. And when we get into the RF, we're going to talk about the differences in that and why one is superior to the other depending on your mission requirements. Um, they both have their strengths and they both have their weaknesses. So we'll talk about um, the different tiers of modulation and what they offer uh, you and your uh, user environments. Okay. Now, if you're into telemetry, you've got to be into standards. The uh, telemetry standards that uh, are, are, are several. The, the, the first and most widely referenced standard is the is IREG 106. A lot of times people refer to it as the IREG. It is not the IREG, but that's what a lot of people call it. There are several uh, IREG documents that you need to be aware of, and I'll call them out, but 106 is the primary one that you really need to know if you're into telemetry. Um, the uh, IREG 106 has 10 chapters. We're going to uh, spend time talking about the, uh, the transmitters. 
We'll spend a little bit of time talking about FM, but we will spend the majority of our time talking about PCM because that's where the market is today. We won't spend a lot of time talking about uh, digital audio telemetry because uh, that is changing so fast and furious that uh, anything the standard says is going to be eclipsed by industry, I assure you. We'll definitely spend a lot of time talking about tape standards because that's certainly something we have to be concerned about is being able to capture that information and being able to preserve it and play it back. Um, we won't be spending much time talking about Chapter 7 because, well, it's, uh, it's tape-based and that's gone away for the most part. Uh, it's being rewritten. We will spend some time definitely talking about Chapter 8 and we'll certainly spend lots of time talking about Chapters 9 and 10. No doubt uh, we will have a lot of interest in that and a lot of opinions. At the end of IRIG 106, um, you have a, a series of appendices. These are things that uh, are either of interest or old standards that are on their way out. You know, for example, on the latter part, look at Appendix K here, PAM. PAM is a type of telemetry uh, that was used before PCM. I will talk a little bit about it. It's still used in a few sp places, especially missile applications, but uh, it's so much a, a minuscule part of the market that they have uh, moved the chapter of PAM from the uh, IRIG-106 into an appendices, and that's kind of a precursor to actually removing it completely. Every uh, year at the RCC, Range Commanders Council, um, the chairman says, all right, anybody still using PAM? And they'll talk about the places where it's still being used and how long it's going to be there. All right, one of these days when he asks the question and nobody speaks up, he's going to say, great, it's time to tell the Secretariat at White Sands to remove Appendix K, and it will disappear from the IRIG-106 completely. Now, there's two parts to IRIG-106. Everything I've talked about is part one. Part two talks about uh, telemetry networks, which is uh, such a uh, living document and a changing document that not many people uh, refer to it. Now, the RCC I talked about, uh, Range Commanders Council, we uh, used to meet semi-annually. I say used to meet because with the sequester, and, uh, and the government shut down. We've basically gone to teleconferencing, <clears throat> which is a real bummer because the last meeting was supposed to be held in Hawaii. Uh, and uh, we had that all proved, and then the sequester hit, and the GSA scandal hit, and they said, nah, nobody's going to Hawaii. Uh, so we didn't go to Hawaii, which honestly, going to Hawaii is not that big a deal because they send you to Kauai, which is a beautiful island. But I've been to Kauai so many times, I almost feel like Forrest Gump when he, in that line, and I went to see the president again. You know, well, I've been to Kauai so many times, and it's so small that, yeah, I'm going to Kauai again. But uh, when, we, when we do have RCCs, or when we used to, and we have them telephonically, the, uh, the things we talk about are uh, typically uh, Chapter 4, because that is PCM telemetry, and that's where we spend most of our time anymore. That's the standards of telemetry. So we spend plenty of time in Chapter 4, and then, of course, we always spend lots of time in Chapters 9 and 10, because 9 and 10 are linked, uh, as you'll see when we get to the recording section between Chapter 10 format and TMAT's header. They all play together, so we spend most of our time in those three areas. CCSDS the Consultative uh, Committee for Space Data Systems is a, uh, is a consortium that was formed in Europe and it was done fundamentally as a money saving thing because uh, Europe they didn't have the kind of money we had in the US for telemetry so you couldn't have uh, every country having their own receiver country, uh, company, their own recorder company, their own uh, transmitter company, their own antenna company so they said if we came up with a standard that was so rock solid that <clears throat> we could allow different people to work on different aspects of the uh, of the requirements. For example, uh, France, why don't you work on just the bit synchronizers? And Germany, why don't you work on just the transmitters? 
And so they broke it up like that so that they would have sort of like a United States of Europe. So everybody could focus in certain areas. And um, it, was, uh, it was fairly successful. Uh, they, they accomplished what they wanted. CCSDS has uh, not been as uh, widely used as you would like uh, for various reasons. First, it started in Europe and in the U.S. It's been very difficult for U.S. companies to break into that. Uh, and secondly, there's been a lot of um, adjusting of the CCSDS uh, implementation because uh, they, uh, in the U.S., they like things their way. And so they uh, rewrote a couple of uh, uh, sections on a per contract basis. So it's not like there's a one CCSDS standard throughout the world and everyone follows it. There is a more of a CCSDS guideline and everybody follows the guidelines, but they've implemented it uh, differently. So it hasn't had the uh, desired effect in the U.S. Europe, not so much. Europe has stuck to the vanilla flavor of CCSDS, not in the U.S. If you get into CCSDS, uh, you'll focus primarily in these two areas, red books and blue books. Like it says here, the blue book are the recommendations or the standards, and the red books are the uh, draft standards. So you'll work in, in those two areas. Uh, in those areas, they have panels, and these are the panels and the, and the specification areas that you might be interested in. Again, unless somebody says you're going to be involved in it, I wouldn't waste the time. Uh, but certainly people will get into CCSDS at some point in their career. Now, the interesting thing about CCSDS is CCSDS could be used and is used to transmit telemetry to the ground. And one of the reasons I teach this course uh, was highlighted at the ITC, which happens to be next week. I, that's why I'm here for two weeks. Um, in one of my classes, I think I had about 25 people in there. So, and uh, it was great. Uh, somebody asked about, uh, well, what's going to happen to CCSDS? And uh, I said, well, it's a good question. Audience? And one guy raised his hand and he said, CCSDS is the wave of the future. Uh, NASA and their new experimental plane, I forget which airframe it was, X-47 or something like that. And he said, it's a fighter plane. It flew, and we used all CCSDS and transmitted to the ground, and it worked great. That is going to take over everything. Okay, that's an interesting perspective. The guy on the other side of the room shot his hand up and said, no, CCSDS is dead. Why do you say that? And he says, well, for example, the two new launch platforms that, that the country, this country just came up with, which was the, the Delta IV and the Atlas V, part of the uh, Evolved Expendable Launch Program, um, launch vehicles, EELV. He says, they're both our cutting edge boosters, and they're both based on Chapter 4 telemetry standards, not CCSDS. Okay, interesting point. I hadn't considered that, and he's right. I mean, both those points are right. So where's it going to lead? Mm, not sure. <laughs> um, it, it's certainly worth uh, studying, and um, I don't think that the future is going to be with either one of those. I think there's a different standard that's coming up. And we're going to talk more about that as, uh, as this course goes on. 1553. Anybody who's involved in telemetry is going to be involved in 1553, I assure you. Uh, Mill Standard 1553 was developed by the Society of Automotive Engineers in their Aerospace Division. It has been around for decades. The last update to it was back in 1978, so you can see it's not a very uh, uh, dynamic, quickly changing standard. Um, and it's used in a lot of places. It has a lot of, uh, of beauty to it, and it's used, uh, you're going to find it all the time. So I have a whole chapter on 1553, so when we get to that, we'll talk more about that. Um, a rink. If you're in telemetry, you're going to at some point be expi exposed to uh, A-Rink networks, 429 and 629. Um, A-Rink used to be an independent agency formed by uh, these uh, uh, legacy companies. However, it recently was bought out by a holding company who's trying to figure out how to make money out of it. Uh, 
I don't keep close tabs on it. I figure they must be just selling standards and troubleshooting, but I don't really know how they've gone from a nonprofit to a for-profit uh, operation. The only A-Rink buses you'll ever hear about are going to be 429 primarily. Every once in a while you might hear about 629 in some Airbus implementations, and I'll talk more about that uh, later.